Hello, everyone. This workshop, you'll learn more about ZooPass and also how to build ZK proofs uh, in under 20 or 30 lines of code. So to kick off, everyone's probably seen this or maybe seen some friends or people nearby show this. This is essentially a proof of your ETH Berlin ticket. And if you haven't already, you can use this to claim testnet ETH on whole sky or Sepolia. Uh, it, it, what happens is you create a ZK proof of your ETH Berlin ticket, proof of ETH Berlin ticket, and you can use this to claim 500 whole ETH. So please do so if you haven't already. Big thanks to Philip who helped put this together. Towards the end, you'll also be able to use ZooPass in order to sign into ZooPoll in order to vote for the Hacker's Choice Award. Um, you can see uh, some folks have already started writing some zoo polls just to gauge excitement. But similarly, you'll be using ZooPass to ZK prove that you're part of this ETH Berlin group uh, such that you can vote on, your, uh, vote on the various hackathon projects at the end of the conference. So what is really going on here? We see this like proof screen. Um, we see this ticket at the top, which says ETH Berlin. And in this case, there's a speaker ticket for me. And the following information will be revealed. I am taking information in my zoo pass, uh, my private information, and I'm creating a ZK proof of this. Specifically, I'm revealing these four fields, my ticket, my event ID, my semaphore ID, and my product ID. So what do these mean? Essentially, they're, I'm revealing parts of my ticket that I don't really care about being, or like I'm revealing exactly the part of my ticket that I don't mind sharing publicly. For example, you notice my email is not on this proof screen here. And you might be thinking, OK, so this ZK stuff is kind of cool. You have this like, ETH Berlin identity you can use for various apps. But isn't writing ZK circuits super hard? Right? It doesn't involve using stuff like Circom, um, you know, Halo 2, Plonky, like all these different terms. And yes, like writing an actual circuit, learning the fundamentals does take a lot of work. Um, it's pretty hard to sort of get up to speed and build something from scratch in a two-day hackathon. So what we've built here, and Rob will talk more about this in a bit, is getting everything you need to sort of create a ZK proof, um, do all that we talked about, use the private information within your zoo pass, create a cryptographic proof on it, only reveal certain fields that you want to reveal, all within this single function. It's in TypeScript, so it integrates with any web app that you might deploy. I'll hand it over to Rob now to go more into the details of how this actually works. Thank you, Richard. To give you a, a brief kind of explanation of, of how ZooPass works, I'll just recap the architecture of the system. And what we want to do here is, is authenticate. And this is a very standard thing that you do in lots of different application frameworks, web frameworks. Um, they all have different authentication methods, things like OAuth, OpenID, or any kind of like API-based authentication. But ZooPass works differently to most of those systems um, where the data that you want to authenticate is held locally on the user's device. So it's, it's either on their phone, um, or it's, it's on a laptop, or a desktop system. Um, but the data is only ever available in unencrypted form on the user's own device. There is a server, and that server only ever sees an encrypted copy of the data. So it's, it's an end-to-end -end encrypted system, and the server is only there to ensure that if I have uh, the data on my laptop, I can, I can get the same data on my phone by decrypting it. So your ZooPass password is actually the decryption key uh, for, that, uh, for that data block. So this is very different from the working of a, you know, an OAuth type system where you're, or you're authenticating with a server. You're basically authenticating with um, something that's already in the browser. So all of the data exchange that goes on between your app and ZooPass is actually happening in the browser. And it's actually happening from two browser windows sending messages to each other, rather than sending messages over the network to a server. And we're able to make this work because we have ZK proofs, which ensure the data integrity. So normally, uh, you know, if you're authenticating and it's like, well, I got this data from the browser, um, you c a server can't trust that. A server shouldn't trust inputs it's getting from, from a client. Uh, it should want to verify those. But because the data that we're getting out of ZooPass has a proof, um, that proof can be verified on the server side. In fact, you can send that data around. You can email it. You can, you can you know, copy it onto a floppy disk, you can, whatever it is you want to do. Um, you'll still be able to verify it in the same way because it has a ZK proof attached to it. 
So this shows uh, an example of an authentication in Zupass. Uh, we have this uh, browser application um, here, and this is a, just a, a web application. In the browser, there's a button, and if you click that button, a pop-up window will open. And this is the pop-up window uh, on the right. And that pop-up window is on the domain uh, zupass.org, which means that it has access to browser local storage uh, for that domain, for that origin. So uh, if I was to open up the developer tools in the browser and look at the local storage, I'd see all of this stuff, uh, you know, sync status and subscriptions and PTD collection and identity and encryption key, which I've, I've blacked out there. But um, if you wanted to look at your encryption key, it would be right there. Because it's, it's in the browser. This is on your device. Uh, this is your private data that is never seen in unencrypted form by, by anybody else. Um, but what we can do is we can, we can have this app in the browser, ask the Zupass app to like, load this data and send me back a proof about some of the data that you have. And in this case, one of those pieces of data is your ticket, your ETH Berlin ticket. So it's, it's going to send back a proof saying this person has an ETH Berlin ticket. And that might include also a claim of certain attributes that you have. So it might include your name and email that's included in the ticket, or it might not, depending on which uh, pieces of data the app has requested. And then once, the, uh, once that message has come back uh, from the pop-up window, then the browser application can send that off to a server to be verified remotely or do whatever it wants with that, with that data. Unlike an API authentication, well, with an API authentication that uh, you're kind of hitting a remote server, like log in with like, Twitter or GitHub or Facebook or something like that, you can only trust the data because you know you just requested it from the server. And like, you know, we have like SSL certificates and things like that to make sure that um, that really is the GitHub server or, or what, whatever. Here, we're not relying on the properties of, the, of that connection. We're relying, again, on, on the proof. So we have this like, cryptographically verifi verifiable proof that goes along with every piece of data. So the steps that you need to implement as a developer are pretty simple. Step one, you have to request the data. And so there's certain uh, configuration parameters that go along with that. You can say like which kinds of fields you want. So here in this example, we have like four different fields are being requested, um, but this is configurable. Um, you can also filter to certain types of ticket or certain categories of ticket. So you could filter down to ETH Berlin tickets. You could say, we will only accept an ETH Berlin ticket. Um, you could make a set of different tickets. So you could say an ETH Berlin ticket or an ETH Prague ticket or a DevConnect ticket. Um, so it's, it's up to you to configure like, the kinds of tickets that you would uh, have as acceptable for authentication in your app. Importantly, this is an interactive process, so the user must approve this. No data will ever be shared out, out of Zupass without the user having uh, approved it. So it's an interactive process. The user has to click the Approve button for this to, for this to work. Then once you have the response back from Zupass, you verify it. And this kind of has two parts to it. One is a cryptographic verification. So you get a claim. So for instance, the claim is like, uh, I have a ticket, and my name is this, and the uh, event ID of the ticket is this, and the product ID of the ticket is this. Um, and you get a proof. Uh, and the proof is, is uh, kind of opaque. And what we do is we cryptographically verify that the proof matches the claim. So this is like a data integrity check. We're checking that like, nobody's tampered with that data. So like, you haven't taken the data and like, edited the name or edited the product ID and then like, passed it on along with that, that proof. Uh, if you change any of those details in the claim, it would no longer match the proof. And so that, that cryptographic verification would no longer pass. And then from the perspective of your application, you also want to check, like, are the claimed values the values that I want? So somebody's presenting me with this claim. The claim matches the proof. And like, does the claim actually say they have the right kind of ticket? If it does, great. We now know in a cryptographically verifiable way that that person really does have that kind of ticket. And then for real world use cases, there's a kind of extra level of security that you should, uh, that you should want to be concerned with, which is things like uh, credential replay attacks. So the proof that I have an ETH Berlin ticket might be consumed by your app, but there might be other apps that also consume the same uh, proof or use that as a kind of authentication credential. And what we don't want is a situation where the, the exact same data can be sent to multiple apps and be received as valid, because then there's a potential for things like phishing attacks or credential replay attacks. So 
you can also add a watermark uh, when you are creating the proof. So when you're configuring this, um, you, you, you're making the initial request, you pass in a number, and that number uh, is your watermark. And it should be a random number or some, something that's hard to guess, something unpredictable. When the proof is created, the proof will also re reference that, that number. So you can then check, like, was this proof created in response to the specific request that I've just made? It's not an old proof from like, some other occasion. So what we covered there is uh, opening a pop-up window, uh, sending a message to that pop-up window, receiving a message from that pop-up window, uh, verifying the results, you know, deserializing the results, verifying the results, adding a watermark, um, making sure that the, um, the values um, in the claim are the values that we expected. So this is all kind of like reasonably complicated, um, but fortunately we've, we've managed to reduce this down to, to something pretty simple. So what we have is this, this concept of a configuration, like a ticket. You can think of this as being like a query for a kind of ticket. Like these are the, these are the tickets that we would match on. These are like the filter criteria for the ticket. So you can actually just import the ETH Berlin uh, configuration directly. There's an NPM package that, uh, that exports this. You then call this function, uh, zooauth popup. You specify the fields that you would like to be revealed in the proof. You add a watermark, and you pass in the ETH Berlin configuration. And that will then uh, open up the pop-up window and give you back, uh, if the user chooses to disclose it, we will give you back uh, a, the, a proof about their ticket, which will include the three fields that are specified uh, in this example. And this is like... I don't know, 10, 15 lines of code. So this is, this is hopefully pretty simple. Once you have this, um, you then want to uh, verify that, um, that information. Um, this is probably something you'd want to do on the server side. So in a web application, you'd, you'd take this result and you would you'd make an API request to your backend. Uh, and then you do this, which is even simpler. Uh, it's basically a single function call to authenticate. And what you're doing is you're passing in the result that we got um, back from ZooPass the watermark, which should be the same as the watermark that was uh, used originally in, in, uh, when you created the request, and the configuration. And the configuration has like, all of the details of like, the ticket IDs and things like that that we can, we can match on. And that's basically it. Like, that's all the code that you really need to be able to build an app that will authenticate somebody as an ETH Berlin ticket holder. And you can use the same principle uh, to authenticate people uh, for hold, uh, the holding of tickets for any other event that has had ZooPass tickets issued for it. So this information is available. So this, this configuration is available in the ZooPass. Uh, there's a ZooPass uh, repo, which if you, I think you probably just Google ZooPass GitHub and it will probably come up as the first result. So there's an example app in there. Um, so I'm just going to show you now if I can walk through uh, what happens in that example app. So let me uh, zoom in this a, a bit. Um, so this is an app, um, just kind of Next.js app. Um, and I'm coming along, and I'm, I'm not authenticated. Uh, my current authentication state is logged out. Um, so I want to authenticate. So I click the Authenticate button, and now I get my pop-up window. And this goes over to ZooPass, and it wants me to prove that I have uh, a ticket, and it's going to disclose my email and my name. Uh, and I can choose the ticket, but in this case, I've only got one ticket that matches the criteria, which is this ETH Berlin ticket. So if I click Prove, that goes back um, to the app. And you, so you can see that the flow of things that happen there. We began the authentication. Uh, in this app, the watermark is generated on the server side. Um, so we, we fetch the watermark from the server. Then we got the watermark, then we opened the pop-up window, then we received the PCD, um, that's a kind of ZooPass technical term for proof carrying data. That's like the, basically the proof. And then we confirmed that we've authenticated successfully. And you can see here it's, it's authenticated me and it's got my, it's got my email address. Uh, and you can see here below is a, is a kind of printout of the, the PCD. This is the data that was received from ZooPass. And if I look at the code for this, um, there's some kind of boilerplate Next.js um, stuff in here, but none of this is React-specific or Next.js-specific. It's all plain JavaScript, so you can call it from, from any kind of JavaScript library uh, or framework. And so what we have is we have a process here which like, you know, fetches the watermark from the server side, um, sets the status as being authenticating, 
then we have this, this asynchronous function, zooauth popup, that opens the popup window and it doesn't return until the user has finished their interaction with the, the popup window. If we got a result back that is a PCD, which hopefully we did, then we call this backend API. So we, we call this login API on, on the server side of our, our example app. And that's where we send through uh, the, the data for authentication. So if I, if I look in here, this, this is the, the server side function. So it's receiving a post. And you know it verifies that the that JSON is formatted correctly and it handles some session stuff. Um, but the, the crucial thing is this line um, here, which just authentic authenticates that the ticket is cryptographically valid and that the configuration uh, details, like the filters in the configuration, match the, the data. And then we do some stuff like saving that in a, in a, a server-side session, uh, and we send a response back to the client. And we have this, this shared um, configuration part, um, which is just like a single variable. Uh, this is the example that we gave before. This is shared between the server and the client side, which is the ETH Berlin uh, configuration. I think I can probably click through. Like the actual configuration looks like this. So this is the thing that's being used to match on the ticket. We have a public key, which is the public key of the issuer, uh, the, the sort of the attester of the tickets. And then we have this UUID, which is like the unique identifier of, of ETH Berlin. There are a bunch of other configurations available. Um, so if you go to the Zupass developer docs, which again, you probably just Google Zupass developer docs, there's a big listing of all of the different configuration values uh, for different events that have had Zupass tickets. And we're adding those uh, to the repo as well. So you can just do this kind of like import that we had on the previous so you just, imp just import it directly uh, in JavaScript, and that, that um, avoids the need to copy and paste. So hopefully, that explains everything about how to authenticate in Zupass. And now I'm going to hand back over to Richard. Cool. Thank you, Rob. So yeah, that gives a sense of how to request a Zupass, or request a ZK proof on Zupass client. And verify it within a web server. Um, but maybe you want to go one level beyond this, beyond a web server. Um, maybe you want to like, make it a bit more trustless, or you want to interact more with the chain. So something that uh, we're excited to introduce is you can also verify these ZK proofs on chain. And oh, here's a QR code that leads to a library that one of Austin Griffiths Bill Guild devs built to verify uh, Z these ZooPass proofs on chain. Just to go a bit more, you know, one level of fidelity into this diagram on the left here, it might be a bit hard to see, but we have three different sort of columns representing the, or th three columns in the top, or th three boxes in the top, and also a smart contract on the bottom representing the sort of different items in this diagram. We have the front end, the back end, zoo pass, and a smart contract. And what's going on is, uh, and you'll see in this video I'll show after, is first we are requesting a proof from ZooPass, and then we are first verifying directly within the front end, so this is least secure but the fastest. Step three is we're verifying the proof within a server, so we're sending that from the scaffold ETH to front end to the scaffold ETH to back end and verifying that within the server. Because it's a bit more secure, we trust the server much more than we do uh, just a client. We also, the demo will also show sending an ETH. And lastly, uh, we send the proof on chain into a smart contract where that ZK proof is verified in Solidity. And after this, a NFT is minted. So that's what, that's what this uh, Groth 16 verifier dot verify proof is calling. It's taking those constants from the proof, verifying it, doing some math operations in a sense. And then if that succeeds, it will go ahead and mint an NFT. You can see more details in the QR code here. And I will go into a video to make some of these things a bit more uh, concrete. So, okay, so I can't full screen this, but I'll start from here. So this is the example app. And you can see maybe roughly the four different steps. So step one is get proof. And what happens is this front end, so this could be an app that you build in Hackathon, um, is calling get proof. And it's opening up this pop-up window, the ZooPass ZK proof pop-up window, um, requesting those three fields. And again, it's asking for an ETH Berlin ticket specifically. 
I click prove, and now the proof is available within the front end. Uh, step two here is verify in front end. So within the client itself, it's going to call that authenticate function, verify that it's valid. Oh, sorry, went backwards. So that's verified in the front end. Um, yeah, went really quickly because the client side verification is super fast of a ZK proof. So that was verifying the front end. And now this step three is verifying on a web server. And if that's successful, it will drip some test ETH, uh, some test scaffold ETH into the wallet that I'm connected with on the top right. So now this step three, the toast is, says back and verified. We verified this. ZK proof of an ETH Berlin ticket in a server, and we're going to send over some test ETH. And lastly, this final step is verify on chain and mint. So this is going to be what sends it to an Ethereum node, where there's a smart contract that verifies the constants of the ZK proof are valid. And if it's successful, we'll, we'll mint an NFT. So we'll, we'll see that. Yeah, it's waiting for a response. And the operation is completed successfully. Just to check, we can go to the block explorer and see that. Yep, the latest operation was a mint item request. Just to show it one more time. Step one. Verifying the front end, verifying the back end, and finally verifying on chain. So you see from here, one way to re uh, so requesting a ZK proof via the Zooth API that Rob just mentioned. Uh, have three different ways to verify it, depending on your use case. Cool. And here is the slide with kind of the proving and verifying all together. Um, again, combined. It's, uh, so here we have the configuration like fully written out. Um, in the previous examples, we've like imported a constant, so it looks a bit longer here. But um, for inf more information and all the content within this, described more in text form, where you can copy code snippets. You can check out this QR code here, which links to um, general docs around ZooAuth and requesting and verifying ZK proofs. Yep, that's all. Are there any questions? I think we have time for a couple. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, watermark. I how does it help avoid the phishing? Can there be a, middle, a man in the middle attack on the watermark? So, so it's a, sorry, that's a man in the middle attack between. Um, so, some malicious actor in the middle between the server and the user. Can, can it be phished? Yeah. I mean. So, one way we can do this is um, one of ro the watermarking for added security. So, the watermark can contain like an arbitrary big int, which really can be serialized from any like set of bytes. So the common sort of like web two mechanism for a lot of this is there's yeah the server generates some kind of challenge, sends it to the client, and the client has to prove some operation over that challenge. So maybe I like do a signature over this challenge, send it back to the server as a JWT, and the server can verify that oh this was a correct like computation of. Or sorry, I think I flipped that around. It's it's actually uh, the server sending the client a JWT such that uh, it can reuse this sort of like sign challenge. In this particular case, let's say like you're worried about a man in the middle between the uh, front and the back end. What could happen is um, like for example, uh, you're in the back end and you're worried about the front end spoofing some zk proof. What you can do is generate a specific challenge for the front end to sign, and the front end. Uh, in the watermark field here, would have to put that specific challenge. Yep. And what happens in the authenticate function is that we check that the challenge that's in the ZK proof from the client is the same challenge that you specify in this function call here. That's one way you could avoid man the middle attacks between the server and the client. My, my question is, is that how do you then have multiple people giving you a challenge? Like, if I want to use how do we know that 
So one of the things that we didn't cover here actually is that you can also pass in, um, so the, the proof does in fact include a nullifier, so that would prevent the same ticket, it could prevent the same ticket being reused uh, if you wanted to check that. So in that case, what you would do is you maybe like store the nullifier on the server side, and if you see the same one again, you just, you don't allow it to, uh, to gain access. Hi, um, I'm just um, wondering how the issuer is working. Is one of the features in the library, or can you explain um, quick, briefly? Thank you. So is that so like a question about like where the ticket comes from, like how the ticket is issued and, and signed? Yeah, there are a number of different ways that a ticket could be issued, um, but the principal way that this gets done is through a feed server. So you subscribe, um, like Zupass will poll a feed uh, and receive new tickets on that feed. Uh, ETH Berlin, for instance, there is a, a feed server that uh, operates, uh, that, that basically handles all of the issuance of the tickets. Um, that's a hosted service. And it's, it's also possible for people to kind of self-host those or to have like many, many different ones. Um, so th that basically acts as the sort of the, the attester on behalf of the event organizers. Yeah, so like for example, this public key field here um, is the public key that's signing the particular ETH Berlin PCDs that are being issued, uh, PCDs that like ETH Berlin card. Essentially how this works is you have to at least trust that this private key is not compromised. Uh, so that's sort of the trust assumption going on here. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you.